Hallelujah. He is an awesome God, and he is worthy to be praised. I thank God for each one of you, and thank God for the privilege to be here in this service one more time. I don't know if you re really recognize it, but, but, but you are blessed to be here. You are blessed to be here. Uh, no, 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 you don't really understand it. You are blessed. I am blessed to be here. Amen. I, 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 you know, as every day goes by and the older I get, I appreciate every day even more. Amen. Because I realize that God graced me uh, with the privilege to be here. And, and so um, I, I do not take it lightly. Uh, I count it a privilege and an honor to be here with you today to worship the Lord corporately. Amen. To come and to get an understanding about what God has for our life and how he wants us to move, to breathe, to have our being, to, to be a, a person who honors him with our lives. God wants to use us to be a vessel of honor, a, a vessel that, that shows forth his kingdom principles wherever we go. Amen? And so I want you to know and understand that you are just that important to God, that he, that he moves heaven and earth just to get to you. Amen? You're just that important to him. Don't ever think, don't let, don't let the enemy sell you some false bill of goods telling you that, that, that nobody wants you, nobody likes you, that you're not good enough, that you don't measure up. Listen, you are God's chosen vessel, and he wants to use you to advance his kingdom principles. Kind of get a witness. I feel like shouting up in here today because we serve a good God. How many of y'all know he'll make a way? Amen. How many of you know that he will make a way? I've tried him, and I know that he will. Amen? So I'm, I'm excited about this opportunity. you got your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. And we're continuing with our teaching from the study of the book of 1 Corinthians. And we are titled this Scandalous, an inside look at the Corinthian church. Because you that have been with us for the last four weeks know and understand that the Corinthian church has some stuff going on. The Corinthian church, because of spiritual immaturity, was facing a lot of challenges. They were allowing sin to run rampant. They were allowing the culture to influence the church to the point to where you couldn't even differentiate whether or not a person was, was a really true born-again believer or whether or not they were still unsaved. And how many know, child of God, that should not be so? So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. And we'll begin our reading at verse number one of this fifth chapter. Amen. First Corinthians chapter number five, verse number one. This is Paul writing to whom? The church at Corinth, right? And so he says this, I can hardly believe the report about the sexual immorality going on among you. Something that even pagans don't do. I am told that a man in your church is living in sin with his stepmother. Verse number two says, you are so proud of yourselves, but you should be mourning in sorrow and shame, and you should remove this man from your fellowship. Verse number three says, even though I am not with you in person, I am with you in the spirit. And as though I were there, I have already passed judgment on this man. Notice what Paul says, I've already passed judgment on this man. I've already declared that what he is doing is not right. Can I get a witness? The church has to call out sin. Back up and see what Paul said again in verse number three. I want y'all to hear that. He says, "What well, I have already passed what? Judgment on this man. We are to judge sin. Verse number four, let's read. It says what? In the name of our Lord Jesus, you must call a meeting of the church. I will be present with you in spirit, and so will the power of our Lord Jesus. Verse five says, then you must throw this man out and hand him over to Satan so that his sinful nature will be destroyed and he himself will be saved on the day the Lord returns. Verse 6, let's read. He says what? Your boasting about this is terrible. Don't you realize that sin is like, a, is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough? Come on, verse 7. Get rid of the old yeast by removing this wicked person from among you. Then you will be like a fresh batch of dough made without yeast, which is what you really are. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. It better say Christ has been sacrificed for us. Now we're going to stop right there and let's, let's do a little unpacking on this scripture text. And again, 
Uh, this Corinthian, uh, the book of 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians are, are two books that, that over the years I've come to appreciate how Paul wrote these letters to the church at Corinth, a church that he had relationship with, a church that he had apostolic authority over. And because of that apostolic authority, he was given the right and he had the privilege to be able to speak into their lives. He had the right and the privilege to receive support from them, even though in a lot of cases he did not because of their mindset. And so there was a relationship between the Apostle Paul and the church at Corinth. Are y'all listening to me today? It's just like this. There should be a, a relationship between me, your pastor, and you, a member of this church. A relationship that, that, that would be able to be nurtured and developed and cultivated to the point that if, if there is an issue that needs to be addressed or we need to talk about something or you're going through something, we ought to be able to come together and sit down and say, you say pastor, I say member. Okay, what's going on? Let's deal with that issue. And that relationship should be such that we can deal with everything that comes our way. And that you should not be ashamed and you should not be uh, fearful about coming to your pastoral leadership and sharing whatever the situation is, whether it's good or bad. Because we are in what? Relationship. In relationship, amen, there's privileges for being in part of a relationship. So Paul had an apostolic authority over this church. He was instrumental in the founding of this church. And so now he begins to speak to them because, again, he had gotten word that there was some stuff going on there. Someone from Chloe's household, again, as I said, it came to him and, and shared with them about the problems that they were facing there. And then they had also written him and asked him to answer some questions that they had about church life. So as we get into this thing, uh, you should have your, your, your outline there with you. But Paul here begins to talk about this issue. And I shared with you that sexual immorality uh, was running rampant here. And because the culture of Corinth which was a metropolitan city that had all types of economic vi vitality going on. You had businessmen from across the globe at that time that had descended on Corinth to make money and to live hard. A lot of them were, were, were doing their own thing. I mean, they were, they were, they were financially prosperous, and, and so in, the, in Corinth was the temple of Aphrodite. We already talked about those things. So let's get into this. So that culture, that, that, that decadent culture in Corinth had influenced the church. And guys, here is something that we have to be very careful about is allowing what is going on in the culture, what is allowing what is going on in the political arena to influence the doctrine of the church. Uh, there are several churches that, that have allowed what is going on politically to, to influence how they look at certain issues, social issues. But I'm here to tell you that the Bible should be our guide. The Bible should be our way for doing life. The Bible and not politics and not your cousin, ma'am. Hello? Should be the, the, the guide light or the guiding post for how you view life. We need to have a biblical worldview. Everybody say biblical worldview. So, so Paul, again, when he begins to write this letter, and we get it specifically into this fifth chapter here, Paul was away on mission, and, and so therefore he was not able to personally deal with this offending brother here in this text that we find in this fifth chapter. However, his spirit overflowed with love for this church, y'all, and it was as though he was with them in spirit, he says. Therefore, he'd, he'd already judged the matter. He'd already, it had came to his attention what was happening, and Paul had already declared what should be done. He made a decision about what needed to be done as it related to church discipline here. And it was too important a matter to leave hanging until he returned. I told you when we started this out, I said, one of the things that the, the tagline that we put up on this sermon series was, uh, the church is too important to ignore problems that need fixing. Will y'all re repeat that with me? Say, the church... It's too important to ignore problems that need fixing. And when I say the church, I'm talking about the local assembly here, but I'm also talking about the universal church. I'm talking about you, you and I, who are part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are integral to God's plan for evangelizing the world. And when we have problems in our own individual life, they are too important to ignore. Amen. We got to fix what's going on with us. 
Everybody say, I need to fix with the Lord help what's going on with me. Say it again, I need to fix the problems in my life. And how many of you know we all have problems? Can I, can I see the hand of one person here who don't have any problems? Could, anybody here don't have any problems? Oh, I'm just good, Pastor. I don't, I don't ever have any problems. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. If you don't have any problems, you ain't living godly for Christ Jesus. If you don't have any problems, you're not living godly for Christ Jesus. Because the Bible says those who live godly in Christ Jesus are going to do what? Suffer some persecution. You're going to have some stuff come knocking at your door because the devil is going to make sure that he gets to you because he does not want you to be uh, effective in, in, in kingdom building business. I, Brother Rod and I were talking and he said something to me and I, 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 I thought about it. I hadn't really thought about that deep. He says, he said, Pastor, you know, it seems like, he says, I feel like in sense that we're on the cusp of something great that God wants to do through this ministry. And it seems like uh, as we get on the cusp of, 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 of that breakthrough that seems like the enemy is trying to attack us. Amen. Attacking the body with sickness, disease, and, and all kinds of things, divorce and things that are happening and seem like he's trying to attack. And I believe that to be true because if you are doing anything that's of substance, if a church is actually having kingdom impact, the enemy is going to come and try to disrupt your flow. Oh, y'all listen to me. He's going to come and disrupt your flow because he does not want you and I to stay focused on the things of God. He wants our attention diverted to something else. He comes with these diversions to try to get us out of the way. Can I get a witness? Are y'all still with me today? So again, so Paul here is, is, is writing, and, and he says three things need to be done here uh, in, in, in church discipline. Number one, the offending brother was to be disciplined in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Again, look with me uh, again at, at this, start at uh, the third verse of this fifth chapter. The third verse of this fifth chapter. Let's read it one more time. It says, even though I'm not with you in person, I am with you in the spirit. Paul was connected when he says, and as though I were there, I have already passed judgment on this man in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now the word our is significant there because Jesus Christ is our Lord. He's my Lord. He's the church's Lord, and he's the Lord of the offending brother that Paul says need to be dealt with. Amen? It is, it is, it is your Lord who is being hurt and cut. It is our Lord who is being hurt and cut when we live in sin, when we have a practicing lifestyle of sin. Do you not realize that if you and I uh, begin to... Uh, connect with some sinful habit or trait and we continue to do that and the world sees us doing that, it affects the ministry's ability to share with people. Are y'all listening to me? It affects the, the ministry. Because again, if, if they find out that Craig the barber is doing some stuff that, that Craig, the, Craig the down low brother doing, then, not, not, not Craig, Craig ain't a down low brother, I'm saying, but I'm using him as an example. Y'all following? If that was known that Craig who's a mess of this church, has an alternative lifestyle, and everybody out there knows it. Now, when Craig, the preacher, comes to share, it's going to affect that person out there in hearing what he's got to say. Can I get a witness? It, whatever sin that we may be entrapped in, then it affects our ability as a local assembly to reach people. Are y'all tracking with me today? So, so, so understand this, number one, the offending brother was to be disciplined in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is, it, it, it's, it's, it's for the Lord's uh, uh, honor that discipline has to take place in the church. It's, it is our Lord who alone can use the discipline to awaken this sinful brother's conscience. So he says here, the offending brother was to be disciplined in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Number two, he says, the, the offending brother was to be disciplined by the church in a special gathering, a special call meeting. Look back with me, if you will, uh, in, in, in this fourth verse. It says, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, you must call a meeting of the church. Now, again, when it says a meeting of the church, uh, I, I think when you get to this thing, this is not necessarily the whole church. Now, understand what was going on. This church at Corinth was flourishing with spiritual gifts. And by all accounts, and when you look at different uh, 
commentaries and, and different theological viewpoints on this, it was, it was thought to be that this man that was doing this was a prominent member of the community. All right? Check it out now, because remember what's happening. Here you have a, a man living in sin with his stepmother. And the church that was flourishing in spiritual gift was not addressing or saying anything about that. Why do you think they wouldn't say anything about it? Because this guy was probably a prominent, he was a prominent member of the church, maybe even a church leader who probably gave good money. Hello? And I mean, you know, sometimes in our churches, uh, if we're not careful, we'll let people slide because of, quote, what, they, what their perceived gifting is. So here we have this guy. Clearly, Paul says what he is doing has not even been named among the Gentiles. What he's involved in, even the unbelievers are not doing this stuff. Even the unbelievers know that incest is wrong. Can I say it again? Even the unbelievers know that incest is wrong. And guys, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, it, it, it's crucially important that we learn how to address stuff in our church and in our families. It, it, it's a crying shame that you have this kind of stuff going on in families. People being molested. And it's, shh, don't tell nobody about it. Here's what we got to do. We got to start shining the light on sin. I don't care if it is Uncle Joe. Uncle Joe need to go. Hello. Well, don't tell nobody, you know, that's going to break up the family. Well, the family needs to be broken up then. If you know that some ancestral relationship is going on, some molestation is going on, shine the light on it. Because that has lifelong consequences to that person who's, who's been victimized by that. I told you that on last week, right? It, it has lifelong consequences for that person who's been victimized. So here we see in this text, the offending brother was to be disciplined in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The offending brother was to be disciplined by the church in a special gathering, okay? A special meeting, a special call meeting of the church. And again, as I said, I don't think this necessarily means everybody in the church because in order to be able to, 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 to provide guidance here, you can't be doing the same thing that person is doing. Are you listening to me today? Because remember, Jesus even made a statement about this in uh, Matthew the 18th chapter, verse 15. Let's go there right quick. Matthew 18, verse 15. I want you to see it again because y'all have, have heard me teach this several times before. And I, I, I keep... I keep preaching this and I keep sharing this because so many times when there's an issue, we won't do it the way the Bible said do it. We, we, we for some reason, don't think that the Bible still applies to us today. Matthew 18, verse number 15. Look at what it says here in verse number 15. Y'all there? Let's read. If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back, right? Now, back up, back up to that again. The first thing it says, do, you do what? Go to them private. Now, again, this is talking about an offense. Now, again, if there's a case where there's sexual immorality or molestation or incest, then it's probably a good idea to take some people with you first. Are y'all tracking with me? It's a good idea to take somebody with you first because if you have been violated by somebody, especially if it's a younger child or something, you need to go with them. But, 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 but any other offense in the church, I mean, or if it's an offense when you are an adult, or it, 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 you need to go to that person. It says, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you'll warn that person back. Verse 16 says what? Let's go. But if you are unsuccessful, take what? one or two others with you and go back again, all right? Go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by what? By two or three witnesses. So here, here's the pattern. I go to them first. Let's say Station, I had it all. Something went on, Station, Station mad at me. She won't even talk to me. When I come over to give a hug, she do this here and go the other way. So, so clearly Stacy's offended by something. So even though she hadn't came to me, I'll go to her because normally Stacy speaks to me. But now all of a sudden, during the fellowship period, she runs the other way. So I, Stacy, is there anything wrong? Did I say something? Did, did, I, did I offend you? Well, whatever it was, I go to Stacy and I talk to her. 
Maybe Stacy gets mad and she just 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 goes off on me and then and not, don't want to hear anything I got to say. So then now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring you wouldn't do that with Stacy, okay? But just in case you did, okay? Now I'm gonna say, brother Craig, will you come with me and Sister Constance? Will you come? Let's go and talk to Stacy because apparently what I'm saying she's not receiving. So I'm gonna take two or three more spiritual people with me. I'm not gonna take a gossiper. I'm not gonna take somebody who's spiritually immature. Because when you get in there and then Stacy start yelling, you may start yelling back. So I'm going to take two or three more spiritual brothers or sisters with me and we're going to go to, so that, that everything I say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. All right? Then third, look at, look at the next verse. Let's go. It says what? Uh, if the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Take it to church council. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision... Treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. In other words, at that point in time, you're going to disfellowship from that person because they refuse to follow the church's decision. And I'm going to get to something here in just a second, especially as it talks about how we relate to each other as believers in matters of, uh, uh, of, of church order uh, or in matters of, of, of some kind of alt that we have. When the church, amen, what? I'm not talking about just anybody in the church because everybody don't qualify to, to give judgment. You got to be spiritually mature. You got to be grounded. You got to have, amen, amen, God's wisdom to be able to share with people. But when the church makes a decision, then that decision should be respected by both parties. Are y'all still with me today? So, again, let's get back to our, to our text. So, if the person still refuses to listen, take a case to the church. Then if he won't accept the church's decision, then you disfellowship. Let's get back to 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter right quick. All right, defending brother was to be disciplined by the church in a special call meeting, okay? Paul says that, uh, Paul said he wasn't there with you physically, but he was there with him spirit. The third thing he said, defending brother was to be disciplined through the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Through the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what are, what are you talking about? He was to be delivered to Satan, the scripture says. Now, what does that mean, guys? How are you going to deliver somebody to Satan? I thought we were on the same team. Because again, he said, our Lord. So that means that, that this guy was a professed believer, yet he chose to, uh, because he felt like he could, I guess, to live in sin with his stepmother. So, so what, what should the church do in a situation like that? Well, Paul Jesus already gave us the order there, but Paul is laying down specifically what the church at Corinth should have done because, again, the church at Corinth was flourishing with spiritual gifts. The church at Corinth had prominent people in the church, and no doubt this guy, because they allowed him to keep doing this and nobody said anything, this guy apparently had some prominence. Now, guys, listen to me carefully. Listen to me carefully. In the church, I've told you before and I'll say it to you again, Whatever you do out there in the secular world does not give you special privileges in the church. When you come to the church, you got to check your title at the door. I don't care who you are, where you, what you've done career-wise, we appreciate that. And maybe those, those skill sets can be utilized to help us do ministry. But because you are the vice president of your bank, don't mean that you come and run the church. Those skill sets don't automatically translate. I said don't automatically translate. There can be people who are, say for instance, you, you may be a, a, a school teacher, but the, you, you make, a, make a horrible Sunday school teacher. All right? Because, see, teaching the Bible is different than teaching math. Amen? So don't automatically Assume that you're going to make a great Sunday school teacher. Amen? Could be, but it's not automatic. Everybody say it ain't automatic. So your, your titles have to be checked at the door. So we, let, let's keep moving, okay? So the offending brother, amen, the offending brother uh, was to be turned over to say, what he's saying here is, at this point in time, go back with me, if you will, uh, at, look down with me at verse number, let's pick up at verse number four again. Verse number four, it says, it says what? In the name of our Lord Jesus, you must call a meeting of the church. I will be present with you in the spirit, and so with the power of our Lord Jesus. Verse 5, let's go. Then you must watch what he said. Now, this is Paul talking to the church. You got a situation where it was, this guy hadn't just fell into sin or got caught up for a little period of time. 
the connotation of this scripture text says this guy was practicing this lifestyle because, again, when we go back and look at this, come on, back up with me real quickly. Uh, let's, let's go with me, uh, go back with me to, uh, to verse number one. Go back to verse number one. And verse one says, I can hardly believe the report about the sexual immorality going on among you, something that even the pagans don't do. I'm told that a man in your church is what? He's what? He's what? Living in sin. What, what does that mean? That means with the stepmother. What about us? Uh, this, this guy was actually staying with her. And they were acting as if they were husband and wife. See, when you're living in sin, that means that this is a practicing lifestyle. This wasn't a slip up. This wasn't a, 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 a momentary, uh, you know, uh, uh, wasn't a momentary, you know, just, uh, you know, got off track. How many of y'all ever got off track momentarily with something? It may not have been this, but, but when you look around, you say, why in the world did I do that? I know that's not me. That's not, that's not who God made me to be. I, I messed up. This guy was living in it. He was practicing, and the church didn't say a word. I believe the reason, one of the reasons why they didn't say a word, because this guy obviously carried some weight in that church. This guy obviously probably had some, some economic prominence. And so the church was flourishing in spiritual gift, but they wouldn't deal with this man's issue. So the church has a responsibility to deal with the issue and do it the right way. When he says, turn him over to Satan, what he's saying is, is that, and don't miss this point here, the sole purpose of church discipline is not to punish the person, but to get the person to repent. Let me say it again. The sole purpose of church discipline is to get the offending brother to repent of his ways. This guy was living in sin. This guy had a practicing lifestyle of this stuff, and the church was not addressing the issue. And because they were not addressing the issue, uh, it was weakening their testimony. The world knew what was going on. How many of y'all, when y'all were out there in the world and you saw Christians uh, 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 tipping and dipping and how many of y'all remember when you wasn't saved and you saw somebody else who was singing in the choir, they were out there in the club with you doing exactly what you were doing? I didn't see some hands of somebody who remembers some Christians who were out there. Supposed, you know, on Sunday, they would lift up the name of Jesus, but during the week, they were doing something else. Did that affect how you saw them? Huh? It affected how you saw them, and it actually would diminish their ability to speak truth into your life. Guys, I'm telling you, all of us, can mess up, but I'm talking about somebody who is, is, is ingrained in sin. Somebody who's, who's not even thinking about uh, trying to get out of it. They are, they are walking in the, in the pleasures of sin because sin is pleasurable for a season. And when that season is up, can I get two witnesses in here? When that season of pleasure is up, the hell that it brings the hell that sin brings in your life, you'll soon forget about the pleasure that you had for two years of two months. See, some of y'all, when you, when you first hooked up with him, it was, it was, it was sweeter than sweeter can be, can And you were, you were indulging and you were, you, were, you were all over him. He was all over you. And, and you thought that, that, that you had died and gone to heaven. Until, until the pleasures of that sin was up. And you found out he was crazy as a Betsy bug. <laughs> Hello? The pleasures of being with her soon waned. And now you couldn't stand to see her coming. Guys, I'm telling you, sin, what, we already said it. What, what would sin do? Take you farther than you want to go. It's going to keep you what? Longer than you want to stay. And it'll do what? Cost you more than you're willing to pay. That's what sin will do. It'll do. It looks good on, it, it, on the surface until you get it involved in it and it catches you out there. This guy here was, 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 was ingrained here. So we, we keep moving here. So, so when it says turn him over to Satan, what he's saying is, is that as a church, when something that is clearly, I mean, uh, flagrantly being done by a member of the church and it's commonly reported, as the KJV says, the church has to address the issue. Paul's problem with the Corinthian church was 
that they knew this man was doing this. He was doing stuff that the Gentiles, the, the unsaved, were not doing, and the church never said anything about it. And I believe they didn't say anything because this guy was prominent. This guy gave good money. And guys, let me tell you something. He says, you got to deal with it. He says, you got you to put him out because he hadn't changed his ways. So what was the purpose of putting him out? What, what does it mean to turn him over to Satan? Well, here's what you got to understand. What he says, turn him over to Satan, what he's saying is, is, is th this guy has to be outside the church. And when you're outside the church, that, that, that's symbolic of you being with the world. In other words, if he's going to keep doing this and he's not going to repent, you got to make a decision and say, hey, you're not welcome here. Why are you doing that? So what's the reason why? Why are we doing that? So that he can see the error of his ways. So he can recognize that, listen, this is not kosher. This is not right. And the purpose of doing that is to get him to turn around. Everybody say turn. The purpose of church discipline is to get the person to fall into a state of repentance and to, and to, and to turn away from the sin that they're in. It, church discipline is really important for us to exercise. Now let's keep moving here. So, so, so again, how did this guy get here? Well, I, I believe it, when you look at this, we, we look at the outline, bondage to sexual sin results from a failure to guard your heart. Go to Proverbs, the fourth chapter. How did this guy get there? Because sometimes in our own life we wonder, how in the world did I get here? How did I find myself being hooked on this, this drug or this substance? How do I find myself being hooked on alcohol? How did I find myself... Uh, in this state of being where uh, I, I'm almost in financial ruin. How did I get to this point? Well, Proverbs, the fourth chapter, and let's begin our reading at verse number 20. Proverbs 4, verse number 20. Let's, let's go down through here right quick. It, I, I believe that bondage to sexual sin in particular results from us not guarding our hearts. Look at what the... What, 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 what Proverbs, Solomon, as he, as he writes with godly wisdom, says here in Proverbs, the fourth chapter, verse number 20. Will y'all read with me? Let's go. Come on, let's go. My child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my word. This is wisdom talking. How many of you know God is wisdom? His word is wisdom. Watch what wisdom says. Don't lose sight of them. Let them penetrate deep into your heart. What is them? His words, okay? Verse 22, let's go. It says what? For they bring life to those who find them and healing to their whole body. 23, let's go. Guard your heart above all else for it, what is it? The heart determines what? The course of your Life, the heart determines the course of your life. When Solomon refers to guarding the heart, what he really means is the inner core of a person, the inward you. I mean, it's the totality. I told you this before. It's the totality of your thoughts, your feelings, your desires, your will, and your choices. Can we say it together? It's the totality of my thoughts. Everybody say thoughts. My feelings, my desires, my will, and my choices. And so your thoughts, your feelings, your desires, your will, and your choices, that's who make you who you are. And he says, guard, guard your thoughts, your feelings, your desires, your will, and your choices because they will determine the course of your life. Is that what it says? Look at 24 through 27. Let's read it right quick. Avoid all. Perverse talk, stay away from corrupt speech. Now watch this, back up, back up. He says, what wisdom says, avoid all what? Perverse talk. Stay away from, what is corrupt speech? What is perverse talk? Perverse talk is, is, is perverted talk. All right? What is corrupt speech? Speech that is not God honoring. Profanity. Gossip. Slander. How many of you know that just because you know something about something and it may be true that you know it about what you know about, it's not good to say whatever you know about what you know about? The child catch that. That was, that was almost speaking in tongue, wasn't it? All right. Guys, we have a responsibility 
as a believer to be God honoring with what comes out of our mouths. Because we know and we understand that death and life is in where? In the power of the tongue and they that love it eat the fruit thereof. He says avoid all perverse talk. Stay away from corrupt speech. Look at 25. Come on, let's go. Look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. 26, 27. Let's go. Mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. 27. Let's go. Don't get sidetracked. Don't get sidetracked. Say it again. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from what? From following evil. Now let's go, go to verse 5. Here's what happened to this guy here. He, in, in, in Corinthians, he didn't guard his heart. He, he, didn't, he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't watch out and he didn't guard his thoughts, his feelings, his desires, his will, and his choices. I don't know how he and his stepmother hooked up, but they hooked up and it was sinful. Sometimes we, we, we try to give ourselves a pass because of how things happen. How, how, what, what led us to the sin? Pastor, you know, I was just, I, I, Pastor, you know, it's, it's been a long time and I was lonely. And yeah, you were lonely, but that only skewed your sin. And you know, you know, he came along at the right time and when I was vulnerable. And, 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 and I just could not help myself. How many of you know that could not help myself is not biblical? The Bible says there is no temptation that's, that, 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 that's overtaking you that's not common to man. In other words, you ain't facing nothing that nobody else has ever faced. But God will, with that temptation, also make a way for you to escape so that you can do what? You can bear it. You can bear up on it. You, you, don't, have to, you don't have to indulge. Now watch this. Go, go, go to this fifth chapter. Watch what, watch what wisdom says. Because this, this, this guy in our story didn't guard his heart. Look at verse, verse 1 uh, of, of the fifth chapter of Proverbs. Watch this. Watch this. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Proverbs chapter 5, verse number 1. Let's get there right quick. It says, my son, pay attention to my wisdom, listening carefully to my wise counsel. Verse 2, let's go. Then you will show discernment and your lips will express what you've learned. For the lips, watch this now. Watch this. Guys, I want y'all to listen to me very carefully. Guys, if, if we're not careful, we can be gullible when it comes to the opposite sex. I need y'all to look at me, brothers. We can, we can be gullible and not realize what's happening and we can get snared up and, and caught all up and, and before we know it, we we out there. Watch what Proverbs says. Now, uh, brothers, y'all, listen, I'm, I'm talking to brothers in particular. Now, why, women, you know, the Bible even says something about, about, about you all too. Y'all could be silly, captive women, led astray by some, some, some guy. Yeah, yeah, it, it happens. Huh? I was reading uh, just the other, other day about this. There was a guy who, uh, who, who presented himself to be something on social media and dating sites that he was not. Now, y'all listen to this carefully. And it was very interesting. I read, and, and, and the guy went after educated women. This one particular lady that they were talking about, was a, she was a, a nuclear physicist. And this guy in his profile presented himself as to be a very smart guy. Uh, you know, he was, he was working on his doctorate and something. And, and come to find out, this guy had played about seven or eight different women. I mean, just made up a total identity. Now, I, I, I'm going to say something here, and y'all may call me old-fashioned. You may say that, well, Brother Pastor, you just don't know this how they're doing it nowadays. But let me tell you something. Uh, uh, it, when you meet people, uh, before you just go head over heels and, and jump into, into a, a full-blown relationship with somebody who you met over the Internet, you better be careful. Because it, 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 really, it, it really struck me uh, that, that this guy was able to do that, but he was on these dating sites, and he presented himself to be something that he really was not. How many of y'all know that people, when you, even when it comes to Facebook, and again, I, I, it's, it can be a tool for good, or it can be a tool for evil. 
So I'm not saying throw social media away altogether. I'm just saying as a believer, you have to be careful. Anybody, most people who, most people who posting stuff or posting stuff to make themselves look like something that they probably really are not in person. So what I'm going to tell you is be careful. Be wise and be discerning. Okay? Y'all with me? But let me get back to what I was saying. Guys can be gullible. Hello? Watch what the text says. Can we, can we walk through here? Brothers? Because see, sometimes, sometimes our wives can pick up on spirits that we don't pick up on. They be saying something like, hmm, I don't know. It's something about her. She got a spirit on her. Huh? Yeah. For the lips of an immoral woman are as, watch this, for the lips of an immoral woman are as sweet as honey and her mouth is smoother than oil. Watch out, brothers. Everybody say, watch out, brothers. Look at verse number four. Come on, let's go. Let's go. It says what? But in the end, go, go, back, go back to verse three. Come on, come on, come on. It says her, her mouth is what? Smoother than oil. Verse four. But in the end, she is as bitter as poison. Some of y'all have found it out, haven't you? As dangerous as a double-edged sword. Come on, an immoral woman. Look at verse five. Can we go? Let's go. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lead straight to the grave. <laughs> For she cares nothing about the path to life. She staggers down a crooked trail and doesn't realize it. Verse number seven, let's go. So now my sons, listen to me. Never stray from what I'm about to say. This is wisdom talking to brothers. Let's go. Look, next verse it says what? Stay away from her. Don't go near the door of her house. I'm telling you what the Bible says. <laughs> Stay away from her. Who? That immoral woman. Don't go near the door of her house. Verse number nine. If you do, you're going to lose your honor and you're going to lose to merciless people all you have achieved. How, yo, Look, look, at, look at even in, in, our, in our political perspective, even some of that stuff that's going on up in Virginia and, and, and you see this happen all the time with the politicians. Again, you know, I don't ever put anybody up on a pedestal. I don't put me on a pedestal. I don't put the president on the pedestal. I don't, I don't put a governor or a senator on, on a pedestal because all of us are subject to falling. Are y'all listening to me? He says, but watch this. Here's what wisdom is warning us. If you do, you will lose your honor and will lose... To merciless people, all you've achieved. Look at verse, watch this next verse. Watch this. Strangers will consume your wealth and someone else will enjoy the fruit of your labor. You don't build that house? Come on. <laughs> Three bedroom house in the suburbs and now Jody up in there living. Some of your old folks, some of your old folks get that reference, don't you? Built that nice home when you first built it 10 years ago, you and your wife was happy and everything and everything was going good. And next thing you know, <laughs> somebody remember that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Go, go home, go look it up. Go look it up. Jody got, Jody living up in there. <laughs> Someone else will enjoy the fruit of your labor. Watch this, watch this. Someone else will get your position. Because you, you, you're in the military and the military don't play with officers fraternizing with those who are up under their command. They, 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 they will fire you. They will, they will, they will put you out. Am I, do I have any military brothers here? Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? They don't play with that. Because here's what they realize. If you get an officer or it, it, it connected with somebody else or if they are in, involved in an adulterous relationship, it could affect their, how they command. That's why a lot of times places of employment don't, don't want you to hire your wife or your brother or sister because, you know, it, it's sometimes it's hard to differentiate and make those hard decisions. How are you going to fire her or discipline her and you just slept with her last weekend? And you married. 
And you tell her what she got to do. She said, mm, I'll tell you what, if you do that, you guess what's going to happen? I'm going to drop the dime on you. Now, what you going to do now? All right, come on. Strangers will consume your wealth. Next verse. Come on, let's go. Let's go. Says what? In the end, you will groan <laughs> in anguish when disease consumes your body. When you catch something you can't get rid of. Next verse. Can we keep going? This is wisdom talking now. You will say, how I hated discipline if only I had not ignored all the warnings. How many of y'all will testify right now and say, Pastor, I've been there. It may not have been with this issue, but how I hated discipline if only I had not ignored all of the warning signs. There are many times when we're dealing with whatever we're dealing with that God will give us some warning signs, some red flags. A word of wisdom will come from somebody and say, hey, man, you better be careful there. Amen. But you ignored it. Yeah, you ignored it. How, how I hated discipline. If only I had ignored all the one, if I had not ignored all the one. 13, come on, let's watch this, guys. Oh, why didn't I listen to my teachers? Why didn't I pay attention to my instructors? I was going to Sunday school. I was going to men's ministry and women's ministry, but they said all that stuff. But you know what? I said, I got this. I said, they don't know my situation. I got it covered. You know, I got, I got my little thing going. You know, and you said you got your little thing going. All of a sudden, your thing was no thing anymore. And it broke wide open. God will warn us. Before he disciplines us, he warns us. Keep reading. Let's go. Next verse. Come on, let's go. I have come to, to the brink of utter ruin, and now I must face public disgrace. It happens quite often. Verse 15. Let's go. It says what? Drink, drink water from your own well, brothers. Share your love only with your wife. Verse 16. Come on, back up and read that again. Back up, back up. Verse 15. What? what? It says, come on. Everybody say, brothers. Drink water from your own well. Share your love only with your wife. Yeah. Let that sink in just for a second. Now look at verse number 16. Because see, some, 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 of you, some of you sitting there, and I need to warn you. Okay, I need to warn you. This is wisdom warners. Wisdom say, why spill the water of your springs in the streets? Having sex with just anyone. Look at what it says. Watch this. Watch this. 17. Come on. You should reserve it for yourselves. Never share it with strangers. 18, let's go. Watch this. Let your wife be a fountain of blessing for you. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. 19, let's go. Come on, we got wisdom talking to us. Look at what wisdom says. Wisdom says she's a loving deer, a graceful doe. When you go home today, brother, say, baby, you are a deer. You're a loving deer. You're a graceful doe. Just tell your wife that you're gonna blow her mind. You are, baby, you just like you just you like Bambi to me. You look. <laughs> watch this, watch this. She's a loving deer, a graceful doe. Look at what it said. Look what wisdom says. Watch what wisdom says, brother. Let her breasts satisfy you always. May you always be captivated. What? May you always be captivated. What? By her. Love. Look at this next next verse. Come on, watch this. Watch this. Why be captivated, my son, by an immoral woman or follow the breast of a promiscuous woman? Mmm. 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 Everybody said, mmm. See, see what, what looks good <laughs> ain't always good. Somebody once says, the grass always looks green on the other side of the fence until you get over there and find out it's artificial turf. I, I, I made, did nobody say I just made that up myself. <laughs> I, the grass looked green on the other side until you got over there. Mm -hmm. 21, come on, let's go. For the Lord sees clearly what a man does, examining every path he takes. Everything that we do, guys, God is... God is watching us. Now get back, get back, get back. So, so, so it, it, it comes from bondage to sexual sin results from a failure to guard your hearts. Guys, we got, and what I told you, your heart is the totality of your thoughts, your feelings, your desires, your will, and your choices that make you and I who we are. So, so Brother Pastor, what are some principles for guarding your heart? For, first thing is be careful what you view. Be careful what you look at. It's been said that the eyes are the windows to the soul. 
that being the case is critically important to monitor what goes into the eye because of its impact on your soul. Remember what Job said in Job 31 and 1? Um, can, can, can we pop it up, Job 31 and 1, real quickly? Uh, look at what Job says in, in, in Job 31 and 1. I, I think it's really important for us to realize this. So be careful, first of all, if you're going to guard your heart, be careful what you look at, what you view. I, Job said that Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look with lust at a young woman. That's what he said. I'm, Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes. I told the young guys when we were doing that, that, that class, every young man battles, I said, learn how to bounce your eyes. You know what it means to bounce your eyes? Come on, you young brothers ought to know this. Uh, Kaderis, you were back there then. We said we talked about bouncing your eyes, right? You remember that, right? See, when you're looking at something that you shouldn't be looking at, let's say, uh, uh, can, I, can, I, can, I, can I just be honest with you guys? You know, sometimes guys looking at ladies and they, you're looking at her backside and you shouldn't be looking at her backside, bounce your eyes. Come on. Hello. You're at church or you're in the mall or you're at work? And your eyes, uh, are, are, are maybe, uh, maybe she's 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 dressed in a revealing manner. You got to bounce them. Be careful what you look at. You know, you know. Again, when you're on the internet, if if if, if a pornographic website pops up, you click it down. Get out of it. Don't go and look. Ooh, what was that? What was that? Now nobody's talking. What was that? Like like some gullible little dog. What was that? Let me go see. No. Click it out. Be careful what you see. Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look at another woman. No, he said, not to look with lust at a young woman. See, what's in your heart, guys? You can acknowledge somebody's beauty without getting into a lustful spirit. Everybody said, be careful what you view. Job understood that temptation often enters through the door of our eyesight through the gateway of our eyes, amen? And that's what Eve experienced when she looked upon the fruit of the Garden of Eden and desired it. Everybody say, bounce your eyes, brothers. Say, bounce your eyes, sister. Amen. Number two, be careful what you think because when you start looking, you're going to start thinking something. Huh? When you start looking at a woman's backside, you start trying to look at the shape of her underwear and a that she has up under, you, 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 you got to bounce. Oh, oh y'all lay looking like, what, what did he just say? I'm telling the brothers, bounce. Because see, what, what a brother will do is he'll start imagining things based on what he sees. And sisters, you got to be careful. Some sisters know what they're doing. That promiscuous woman, That promiscuous woman who wears some low-hugging jeans and then wear her underwear that pops up on top of her jeans? Okay, all right. Mm-hmm. Be, <laughs> be careful what you look at. Everybody say, bounce it, brother. Be careful what you think. Be careful what you think. It, it's been said that we can't always help what comes into our minds, but we have all the control in the world over what stays there. You can't stop birds from flying over your head, but you sure can not stop them from building a nest there. Am I right about it? Okay. We, we got to be careful what we allow to think. The Bible says bring every thought into captivity unto the obedience of Christ. Be careful what you think. Third thing I want you to just, just jot down, look at it right. Be careful what you feel, amen? Be careful what you feel. Don't, don't, don't let your feelings be the driver of your actions. Don't let your emotions be the driver of your actions because feelings come. And sometimes, you know, feelings are real, but feelings may not be the truth. Feelings are real, but you should not make conscious, you should not make decisions solely based off of what you feel, what your emotional realm is, because your emotional realm changes. And your emotions may not line up with what Scripture teaches you. 
So be careful what you feel. And I told you this before, emotions can be affected by a wide range of things, conditions. I mean, it, it, you, you can, all kinds of things can deal, mess with your emotions. Remember we preached that series, Lord, deal with my emotions? Because too many Christians are making decisions out of their emotions and how they feel at a certain period of time and not allowing the word of God to dominate their choices and their decisions. Fourth thing, be careful where you go. Be careful where you go. Psalm, you remember Psalms, uh, the first number of Psalms says, um, you, know, you know, about uh, not walking in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sitting in the seat of the scornful, but his, his, his delight is in the Lord. And in his, in his law does he meditate day and night. So you got to be careful who you hang out with, who, where you going. I mean, be careful where you go. One of our most important choices is the friends who we walk with. If you walk in with brothers and all they do is talk about women and drink and cuss and smoke and do all this other kind of stuff, then, you know, chances are you, you, you may end up doing the very same thing if you're not going there to minister to them. And if you just got saved, you're not strong enough to go and minister to them right now. You need, you need to grow in your faith. Now, we ought, to, we ought to hang out. We ought to spend some time with the unsaved because how are we going to minister to them if we're not uh, there with them? Go back to, go back to uh, 1 Corinthians 5. I'm going to stop here, okay, because i, I got to show this with you, share this with you, and we got to get out of here. 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. Watch what he says here. Glory to God. Look, look down with me. Because Paul told him, how are we going to deal with this guy Who's, who's, who's living in sin with his stepmother. What, what do you tell him to do? Somebody talk to him. What do you tell the church to do? Come on, y'all. I've been preaching all this time. Y'all don't. What do you tell the church to do? To disfellowship him. To put him out the church. That's what he said. Paul said, I already made, I, I've already judged what we need to do. Why was he telling him to do that? So that he can do what? He can repent. He can see the error of his ways and repent. Now get back with me. Verse number nine. So put him out. But what about, what about the people who are not saved? How are we going to get them saved if we're never around them? We ought, we ought to be around them. We ought to spend some time with people who are not saved. That's what Jesus did. Didn't the religious leader get mad at him because he was spending time with people who were, who, who were considered to be just, just foul and rank sinners? All right? See, we, we got a responsibility to share the, the, our faith with others. He says, when I wrote to you before, what he, told, what he said, I told you not to associate with people who indulge in sexual sin. But now look, look at what he says, verse number 10. Watch this. This is Bible. Can you read with me what does Paul say? But I was not talking about unbelievers who indulge in sexual sin or, or who are greedy or who cheat people or who worship idols. You would have to leave this world to avoid people like that. Look at what he says in verse number 11. He says, I meant, watch this, you are not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer, yet indulges in sexual sin. Your, your cousin Joe, who you know he ain't saved, don't go to nobody's church. Yeah, you, you know he, he, he doing all this sexual stuff. You need to keep, keep going to Joe, talking to Joe, praying with Joe. He ain't even saved. But you got Brother Bill who's a deacon of the church. He's doing the same thing. Stay away from him. I'm not, y'all looking at me like I'm saying something that's, that's foreign. That's what Paul just told him. He says, I meant you are not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer yet indulges in sexual sin or is greedy or worship idols or is abusive. I mean, you know, we got Christians who are abusive in relationships, physical abuse. Or as a drunkard, you're in church, but you're getting drunk every weekend. No, just get your little tail on up out of here. In other words, you can't hang with believers who get drunk every weekend. Paul said, "Don't, don't." He says, "Now, if they if they ain't saved, you trying to get them saved, so you got to build a relationship with them. But somebody who knows better been getting teaching at this church, and they getting drunk all the time, can't hang with you." Why, what's, the, what's the purpose of that? You're trying to motivate them to repent. Because I can't, you know, we, we can't pretend like it, ain't, it doesn't exist. The church has to do a better job of, 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 of dealing with uh, unchecked sin, sin that's, that's pervasive and habitual. 
I'm not saying you call somebody out on every little thing they do when they fall, but we're talking about people who, who are unrepentant, who are not trying to get out of it, who don't care what you think and nobody else thinks. We got to deal with it. Or, or, or worship idols, or is abusive, or is it drunken, or cheats people. Look at what he says. Don't even eat with such people. Stop going to lunch with them. I didn't make that up. That's what the Bible says. What did it say? Last sentence. Let's read it out loud on purpose. Don't even eat with such people. Verse 12 and 13. We're going to close this chapter out. It isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders. Listen, guys, quit trying to get people to, who ain't saved to stop doing what they're doing. That's, that's not your job. Your job is to present Christ to them and they accept, when they accept Christ and they become a born-again believer, then now we help nurture them and grow them in their faith. But, but just go and trying to get your unsaved loved one to stop sinning, that, that's not even your job. He says, it, it isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it certainly is your responsibility. Who is he talking to? The church. It is your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. That's Bible. So we've been, we've been hearing people say all the time, don't judge me. What did you say? What did you say? What? Though, I need us to read it out loud on purpose because you need, you need to have some word with you when you talk to this believer in the church who's just sinning and somebody, but don't judge me. Yes. He says, it isn't, Paul said, it isn't my responsibility to judge outside it, but it is certainly your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. That's Bible. Verse 13, let me close it. God will judge those on the outside, but as the scriptures say, you must remove the evil person from among you. The person who won't listen to you, the person who you went to them and you talked to them, the person who you took two or three other brothers and sisters with you and y'all talked about the issue that, that you, that's dealing, that's prevalent, it's been a long-standing issue, he hadn't repented of it, he's not trying to get out of it, and then you, you brought it before church council, the church made a decision, and then now, uh, you know, when that, that, he says, remove that person from among you. That's Bible. But the motivation is love. Because any parent who loves their child will discipline their child with the hopes of that discipline causing them to repent of that evil behavior. And all, all Paul is saying here is, is, listen, there are times in the church where we have issues that we are ignoring and we need to deal with it. And he says, do it out of love, not that we're any better than anybody else, but there are times when, when we have stuff that comes up that needs to be addressed, let's address it. And prayerfully, you're dealing with somebody who, 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 who understands that, that you're doing this out of love. And the purpose for doing this was this, it had got to the point where this guy was ignoring everybody. He was just doing it openly. And Paul says the church can't operate that way. And, 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 and sometimes this is a, well, I don't know how rare this may be, where you have something that's open like this and nobody says anything about it. But we, let's deal with it in love. Because the purpose of church discipline is what? for that person to repent. Not, Jesus has told them, you know, to put them out so they can see the error of their ways and then realize this is really serious. People care about me and they don't want to see me keep going this way. Amen. God loves you and I love you too. And I thank God for you. Let's keep learning and we'll pick up on next week. Amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise. God bless you. <laughs> Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this opportunity. You are a wonderful Savior and Lord.